What if I told you that speaker measurements are lying to you? This one is going to be very juicy. It's going to trigger a lot of people, but it's all true. I have the proof from your unique ear shape. To how our brain evolved so we didn't get eaten by a saber-toothed tiger, or at least our ancestors, you might not even be here had it not been for good hearing. And yet with all of this, we're told to trust graphs, that that's how the artist intended it to be. Well, I want to talk about that later. But if you skip this video, you may keep looking at graphs and thinking that's how you should choose to buy speakers. So sit down, grab a cup of coffee, and let's talk about why speaker measurements are lying to you. Before anyone freaks out, I am not trying to throw shade at any of the people that do measurements. Aaron's Audio Corner, I like that guy. Aaron's a nice guy. Audio Science Review, they do great stuff. Great stuff. My boy Ron over at New Record Day. But I've always known this, and I didn't know exactly why. That's why I went on a deep dive, did a bunch of research to figure out why I don't think there's an ideal speaker graph. And our ears are kind of like a thumbprint. They're all different. The human ear. Three main parts. The pinna, it's this part. The middle ear, kind of like Middle Earth, except it's in your ear. Really, it's nothing like Middle Earth because it has your eardrum and bones. And then the inner ear, which has the cochlea and auditory nerve. Each one of these affects how we hear things. Each one of these affects how sound is shaped, even before it gets to our brain, the computer in our head. However, before I bore you with some anatomy lessons, by the way, I took anatomy twice in college, one semester right after another, because I loved it so much. That's not true at all. It's because I didn't do well in it. But let's talk evolution. Our ears evolved so that we didn't get eaten or stabbed by a caveman. Our hearing is tuned for survival. So subtle, high-pitched sounds like sticks breaking, rustling, it's also that we didn't get eaten by a chupacabra or Bigfoot ripped off our arms and started beating us like a drum, making his own music for his hearing enjoyment. That's why our ears are naturally more sensitive between, I would say 1000 Hertz to about 6000 Hertz because that was the danger zone. The outer ear, the pinna, the pinna. It's how it shapes the sound that's coming in. Back in the day when people would lose their hearing, they would legitimately stick like a funnel. These are like funnels. The problem is we all have different funnels. Check this out. If you have a forward facing pinna, you can hear high pitched sounds better. High mid range frequencies better. They can make some speakers sound bright. A wider pinna can actually make the same speaker sound warm, smooth, because it disperses the highs. A deep conca boosts, what is it, mids. Vocals can feel clearer. Large ears often mean a bigger sound stage. Middle earth or middle ear. We have three bones. The malleus, which is Latin for hammer. That's actually attached to the eardrum. The incus, Latin for anvil. It's the middle bone. And the stapes is Latin for stirrup. It's the smallest bone in the human body. So there can be variability in the bones in our ears, which also equals variability in how we hear things. So these bones can be too stiff, which means they don't move well. So that can affect everything from perceived loudness of what's going on around us to things being basically muffled and even balanced between your ears. There's a condition called otosclerosis, which means the stapes bone gets fixed in place due to abnormal bone growth, it leads to conductive hearing loss. Infections, chronic middle ear infections can damage or erode the ossicles. And trauma, when you get kicked in the head by a mule, you may get a little hearing damage or fall down a well. I feel like these are all farm related injuries. I don't know how often anybody gets kicked in the head by a mule in New York City. 
I'm sure it's happened though. Probably at a petting zoo. And then you have the inner ear. Inner. In her ear? Nope. In inner ear. The cochlea. <sighs> it contains hair cells that convert vibrations to signals for our brain. And those hairs don't regenerate. Kind of like going bald in your ear. And this is where exposure to loud noise, so a lot of concerts, not wearing hearing protection. Tulsa Tony, I'm talking to you. And even aging damages these hairs, often starting with high frequencies. And most people over the age of 50 start to have a reduction in hearing above 8K. This means cymbals, sparkles stuff starts to disappear. And, and our music can feel dull, lifeless, soulless. And your perception of a flat measuring speaker can seem boring. And here's where it gets interesting, my friends. Thank you so much for watching. If this is your first time here or you're not subscribed, please consider subscribing if you're getting any value out of this video. You can always unsubscribe later. People do it all of the time. A flat measuring speaker, a neutral speaker. How many times have you heard you should get this because it's how the artist intended the music to be presented? However, unless your ears were exactly like the audio engineer's ears who mastered the album and your room is exactly like the studio. You're not hearing what they heard. It may sound right to them, but there is little chance that you are going to hear it exactly like the artist intended it. Because we're all different. Unique ear anatomy, unique hearing loss. We're all special in our own way. Even tiny changes like one or two dB can radically affect how we hear or how we perceive a speaker to sound. A dB or two at 2800 hertz can sound really annoying. And that's me because my ears are different. I hear 1K to about 3K more than other people because of how my ears are made. Actually, how your shoulders are made, how you sit, all affects how you hear different things. So even your trunk, anatomy affects how you hear things. If you have a bump between four and 6K, things can sound sibilant. If you got those wide ears or you've just got hearing loss, then anything north of 8K, it's gonna seem gone, like it doesn't exist. Air, sparkle, shimmer. Some examples of beloved speakers that don't measure flat, but yet people still love. The Klipsch. Heresy. Most of the Klipsch speakers don't adhere to the straight line frequency response that everyone loves so much, except for me. <laughs> to be fair, I don't like the, really like the Klipsch Heresy either. The BBC LS5A, which is interesting because we were just talking about the speaker in my Patreon. By the way, if you want to join the best audio community on the planet, check out patreon.com slash cheap man. Patreon only Discord, patreon only Facebook group, Zooms on Sundays, some Sundays meetups too throughout the year. So that speaker is considered to be warm with a dip in the presence region. I don't exactly know where that's at. The Klipsch has peaky upper mids. Yes, bright but energetic. I'd say it's very energetic. It's like my eight year old had four pop tarts and washed it down with a monster energy drink. That type of energetic. The Harbeth P3ESR rich mids rolled off highs and the zoo audio dirty weekend the only thing it says is unapologetically colored and fun a lot of the wharfdale the diamond 11 series very warm in the comments if you have experience with a speaker that you know doesn't measure flat but you love it anyway put it in the comments so choosing a speaker making a decision about a speaker based solely on measurement graphs is kind of missing the point. How do you figure out what your hearing is? How do you figure out the anatomy of your ear? How do you figure out or get an idea of your unique perception of sound? Just doing one of these isn't exactly going to give you a complete picture. 
of what your hearing looks like, but it can at least help. So you can do a hearing test. There's free ones online. You can do them with headphones and your phone. You got Who and Mimi. There's a Who app and a Mimi app. Another thing that you can do, and this is especially useful if you're going to an audio show with your buddies, which incidentally, in about two weeks, I'm gonna be at Expona. So if you're going to Expona, and I know some of my patrons are, you can go into a room, not say anything to each other, listen to whatever they're listening to, and then go outside and discuss your feelings or your impressions of that speaker. You can listen to pink noise, or I, I've listened to a tone generator. And if you have that thing hooked up to your system, you're probably gonna need a computer. And then you take the frequency slider and you just kind of move it. And if suddenly you hear a bit of a drop or a bit of a rise, you can kind of figure out okay, my hearing is deficient right here, or I'm hearing extra right here. This isn't the best way to do it, but it is fun to figure it out, and it's free. You can do it today. And obviously you can experiment with EQ, especially when you get the results of what your hearing test is. Then you can go in, if you have something like a Weem Ultra, you can start making adjustments based upon what the hearing test revealed. However, that doesn't really take into consideration one of the most important parts that is unique to you, which is your ear shape. That's why when I did that thing in Florida, my mind was, I always knew that people heard things differently. And I always knew that there's no way that these flat speakers were right for everybody. I don't know a way of figuring that out outside of the thing I did in Florida because it does take into consideration not only your ear, but your trunk, your chest too. And if there is such a thing as a hearing test without headphones, that would be ideal to figure out exactly how you hear things. But that's probably gonna be in like a little anechoic booth or something. So you're not gonna have the full picture. You'll probably have 90% of it though. So this was a very long way to say, trust your ears, listen to what you like. But when people say, that this is how the artist intended it, they're full of crap. Because we're all extremely unique. We have unique hearing loss. We have unique anatomy in our ears. We have unique rooms. With all of this said, I understand why people make neutral speakers. Because how are they gonna know what your hearing is like? But I am sure that there is data that can tell manufacturers, this is where most people have hearing loss at a specific age. That's a place to start. The Harmon curves and other curves like that exist where a thousand people have been tested, thousands of people have been tested to see what their preference is. So there's that. But at the end of the day, I would argue that a flat measuring speaker is going to sound very different to most people. So it's all a lie. Maybe a well-intentioned lie, but a lie nonetheless. Don't feel like you have to like a speaker because other people tell you you should. That was the experience I had with the Kef LS50, which definitely wasn't the right speaker for me, but it could be the right speaker for you. I hope you really liked this video. I really enjoyed making this video and doing the research on it. I always knew, I knew it, but I had to do the work, put it together. So if you like this video, you may love this video kind of along the same lines. I talk about a whole bunch of quote unquote audiophile accepted beliefs that just aren't true. You can check it out right here. So don't binge watch anything on Netflix or Hulu. Binge listen, maybe with a better understanding of how you uniquely hear sound to make better purchasing decisions and fill your soul with happiness. And with that, I'm Randy. I'm the Cheap Audio Man.